Oh, and sort of one other thing tonight, uh, Dave Axel Eggleston, the Norwich uh, Community Representative, will be presenting at the City Council tonight uh, a status on CMEX. Okay, good. Uh, and I uh, know that I talked to Dave uh, Eisinger about it. He'll be uh, attending on Zoom tonight to, uh, to see uh, what Dave has to say. All right, good. Thanks. All right, terrific. Uh, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> The uh, next item on the agenda is the Finance and Audit Subcommittee Report. Michael? Okay, we, we had a meeting last week and we had several presentations on cost drivers, primarily for the gas and electric divisions. And uh, it was pretty detailed, uh, a lot of stuff on pipe updating or you know, gas line updating. And then for electric goods, there's some of the major projects they're working on <clears throat> in the electrical side. I didn't understand a lot of it, to be honest, but, you know, you pick up a little bit here and there. I need somebody like Chris to do an interpretation of some of it. Well, anytime you need more detail, Mike, don't be afraid to ask. Good, thank you. Um, and I, um, I mentioned that I would love to undertake um, concerts with Chris and Laura, some sort of uh, management report. It would be more designed for the people that are area dike in the numbers, like you know, Laura is phenomenal at it. You know, I have some knowledge of our numbers here. I don't really profess to really understand everything, but you know, if we could get some sort of a, I don't even know if it has to be monthly. Maybe quarterly is better. You, Need a little bit of uh, volume in there to smooth things out, but you know, just maybe a four or five line synopsis for each division: sales, one or two cost categories, and bottom line. And then, you know, compared to the quarter of the year before, same thing. And then maybe key performance indicators that Chris has a handle on. He says he uses them, and, you know. So we could do one for the electric division, one for gas, one for water and sewer. You know, I assume there's different key performance indicators for each each division. There's different things going on, but you know, I don't know what they are, but you know, it could be the number of customers increasing or decreasing. It could be uh, you know the volume of uh, the number of electrons we sold or whatever. But um, I'd love to see if we could put together, you know, a report that, that people could kind of digest it in five or ten minutes at the meeting. Because, I mean, the reports that we get are vital right now. And, you know, they're all very comprehensive and, and, and well done, but, you know, it's really, really hard to digest it and spend the time on it that it really needs. Uh, if you really want to understand it well. I tend to look at the bottom line, how it's coming out, and you know, not get too lost in the weeds, you know, if I can avoid it. So I, I mean, I think I have a fairly good handle on it. I know cash balances is an issue too. And, you know, one of the key, I don't know if it's a key performance indicator or just somehow some balance sheet information should be disclosed and that be part of it. Without getting into too much detail, um, you know, it'd be nice to know how much the cash is, how much of it is uh, encumbered by some sort of uh, reserve requirement, and um, you know how much basically is required for our bonding and our loan agreements that we're entering into, and if there's any, you know, how much if any excess do we have beyond the minimum requirements. People here that we have. 45, 50 million dollars here, and they think we're rolling in dough. But you know, if we can show the, uh, you know, how much of it is is mandatory to have just to survive, and get, get financing, I don't think we'd look too rich, or at least we'd have a better picture. You know, to the average person, this could be used for anybody. You know, that we are a public agency. So I, I think I'm pretty. I, the more I thought about it, the more excited about it I got. Hoping that you know we can work together on it. Yeah, so we'll have some ideas in the uh, March 6th 
uh, finance and audit committee meeting. Okay. So that's coming on five in two weeks. Yep. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. <clears throat> Mike, I have a couple of questions. Um, I'm a bit more Chris, but or Laura, but I believe at the meeting, uh, I think Laura said something that surprised me. I don't know if I haven't been paying attention or what, but uh, when we were doing the three year rate set process, we agreed to raise the sewer rates by 6% a year for three years um, because of the rebuild yes. expense or our share of the rebuild expense. But I think Laura said, well, actually, we're going to have to go up 6% a year for 10 years, um, which I wasn't aware of. I mean, I don't know. And, you know, that's compound. So that's probably close to a, over 10 years, 70, 75% increase. And I guess one of my questions is, is that accurate? And, uh, you know, for somebody who has a single family home, maybe that's not in sewers. The actual dollar amount is not that great. But somebody that has a business might see a real problem. Well, well Bob, there's a couple things that are changing dramatically yep. right now. Uh, EPA and DEEP are changing their affordability analysis. We yep. don't know what it's going to look like exactly. Uh, but that just came out, what, today or today? Today, sorry, this morning. Okay. And uh, so that model is going to change. We're going to have to go and engage in our consultants, uh, CDM, to and, and their subconsultants, to relook at this when that comes back out again. Okay. Uh, the six percent a year in perpetuity, per, 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 perpetuity, perpetuity, <laughs> per, right, uh, is affordable per the previous requirements. Okay. They're dumping all this money in. They're probably going to change the affordability requirements because there's more money available and it'll be more available for distressed communities. So we'll see what, where that all falls out. The, the plant's also going to cost more. We know that uh, because the world changed since two years ago when we have the plant. So uh, there's a lot to be, in, in a lot of fluidity in the next uh, couple of months on this. Yeah, I mean, one thing I think that our consultants ought to really take a hard look at and stress in that regard is and a lot of federal programs and so forth depend on census tracts uh, as opposed to overall geographic communities. And, you know, I think if you look at the sewer uh, service that we provide by census tract, you'll find it's even a, a worse economic uh, situation than for Norwich as a whole. Uh, I mean, you look at I, I, I'm not sure about this, but I don't think Cherry Hill has a lot of sewers. Um, Scott Road, I don't think, has a lot of sewers. Um, I mean, that's sort of the, the affluent side of town. Yeah. So, in the past, they said we could afford it, and if, you know, per their model, and essentially, uh, there's not much you can do about it, because yeah. if you say, okay, we're not going to move forward, then you can get a consent agreement to force you to move forward. Sure. Uh, so we could say, you know, we could use affordability to stretch it out to yep. to make it more affordable for longer periods of time. And you know, with the, with the additional funding potentially coming, we may be in, a, in good shape. We just don't know right now. Yeah, I just, my only point is, I mean, Norwich is now ranked the second most distressed community in the state of Connecticut, mm -hmm. but I mean, if we're trying to increase our subsidies from the federal government or the state government for the project, and we're trying to do that based on affordability, we might as well put our best foot or our worst foot forward and do it by census tract, because I really think that there's a big difference between uh, Norwich, which in and of itself is not that big, and the sewer served census tract. Well, Affordability does not mean what, in the past, up until this period of time now, it had nothing to do with how much grant percentage. Yep. 50% is for CSO reduction, 30% is nitrogen, 20% yep. is general plant upgrade. 
what we think we can do is maximize, we get everything uh, funded where there was some things that were getting picked out and pulled out that they didn't want to pay for. I think we can probably get everything funded and then we'll see if there's additional yeah. money available. Up till now, you know, you could have you could have had the, the lowest incomes in the world yeah. and you still would have got a maximum of 50% on any project. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. And those are questions uh, we're meeting with you on Friday this week, and those are questions that we will ask on Friday. And then my other question, um, I think was in one of the documents you sent to us attached to your weekly report, um, is uh, I think we listed employment at 150 jobs. And I know that we used to be 150 jobs, and we dropped down to I think 137. And I didn't know if we had plans to actually go up to 150 or not. But I mean, I think it's, I think, I don't care if we go to 200, if that's what we need. But um, if we can keep it down some, I think that's a good thing. The budget right now has 151 jobs in it. Okay. Uh, we are at 139? 139. Yeah, we're at 139 right now. And uh, there are, significant holes that we need to fill. Okay. Uh, some of the added positions are engineers to manage all this infrastructure, mm -hmm. analysts to manage all this infrastructure. Uh, so financial and operational, we need to bolster a little bit. I, I'm not complaining. All I'm saying is if we can do a savings, we should. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Those are my questions. Anybody have any other questions? Good oh, question, right? I'm just <coughs> Thank you. Okay. That concludes my report. <coughs> Thank, you. Thank you very well. Thank you. Um, so, item six, information and update provided to the board prior to tonight's meeting. Uh, are there any questions for Chris or the staff on their materials we provided that include the leadership team template, financial update, and the budget schedule? Um, no, I, I had a couple of questions on the uh, on the project on the solar seal. Um, you had mentioned that um, they might be increasing their load. Are we are we providing enough power just for today, and we're adding more later if we need to, or are we still going to send enough power up there for their future needs? I'd like to talk about that in the executive session. Well, we just had another uh, meeting with them today at four o'clock. So it's so it's. There's a lot of uh, moving targets here, and uh, that's an executive session uh, discussion. All right. Uh, dissolved air flotation. How did we make out on our 216 date there? Uh, ah, I was playing this morning, and uh, not nearly enough uh, activity going on. So, Steve or Larry? Is Larry on? Larry I don't know. Larry's going to be with that. Larry, you want to provide a quick update on that? Sure, yeah, uh, so Larry Sullivan, we had a meeting with DPH uh, today <clears throat> and is still involved in the integration portion. I mean, the, the unit itself works fine. It's just the details of the integration. So they are going to be asking for additional time to get that complete. Um, the concern is make sure everything's up and running by summer, which it will be. I think that the, they rough, the, laid out a rough schedule of uh, flowing, getting water by March, early March approved by DPH to push water out. They've made promises before, but we have, we have a meeting with RH, RH White, the, the general contractor, scheduled for Monday. Essentially, the units run great. You know, just the controls and the integration of the existing controls to the new controls. That's that's been okay. Okay. Some, uh, integration problems. Okay. All right. Thanks, Larry. Let's see. Um, Second Street Hydro, the exciter repair. It says the exciter did not repair the issue or did not work or something. Is that, what do we think? Uh, is, there, is that going to be a bigger deal or just another exciter or what do we think? All right. So at Second Street, we have two wheels, uh, both half megawatt wheels. Yeah. And uh, so there's not water to run to at all times of the year. So we want to get this thing going. And Eric will have, uh, Eric is on vacation this week as well, not with us. We'll get a better update for that in the next month. I'm going to get that on my Friday as well. That's all I have. I guess I had one question. Um, we had these. We had this um, horse maintenance failed down at the marina, 
and we're doing this big sewer project. We're not, the funding to fix that would come from a different funding source. That's coming from the Clean Water Fund. And, and, but we are going to be doing something with Rose Alley as part of the, so that force main from Rose Alley all the way to the plant would probably be replaced or not replaced. That would probably be part of that project when it ultimately gets, gets all replaced. But it might be done even before that. It might be part of a different project. But what we're doing down there right now is a more permanent temporary repair. Because yeah. yeah. right now we're using a portable pump and all that. So. Yeah. But if we've got, and, and, and that was a force main. One yes, the arena. If you've got force mains that are failing in the marina or wherever they are, does that mean that the whole thing should be replaced at some point? Or we just and, and that's where we're going to be. The force main from Rose Alley all the way to the plant will be replaced yeah. in the project. We're, we And it, we may be able to get it done sooner. Shipping street is another one that's going to have to get all, all replaced as well. Some can be lined, some can be replaced. The case where the bottom of the place is moving, basically. The bottom of the plates is eroding yeah. you know, yeah. from the sand going back and forth. Yeah. And the Rose Alley Force Man, I think back in over 10 years ago, we had the same issue in Howard Brown Park, so that's of the same generation. Yeah. And we're not sure if the current leak down there is that. It might be a joint, but we can't get to it <laughs> to determine what it is. What is the pipe now? Is it test iron? Test iron. Oh. Okay. All right. That's all I have. Thanks. Any other questions? Thank you. Yeah. On that hail snow project, Antic, I, you know, we were talking about, so I, I haven't down, been down there in a long time, so I took a ride down there on Sunday. It looks like, are they putting a septic system in the back? No, they're going to be a sewer pump. They're completely tied into the, they will be tied yeah. completely Because it looks like a huge leaching field with crushed stone and then uh, pipes. drainage or what, but. Yeah, it must be drain, maybe it's I don't know. And then um, every time I drive westward over the viaduct, I look up towards Laurel Hill and I see those arrangements of pipes cascading down the side. Is there anything that can be done to correct that problem, Chris? I know it's. We have a design to do that. I think it's about 17000 a home to make that happen. There's a lot of ledge up there to do it correctly. And uh, there's no interest in anybody. So it would be a $17,000 contribution by each property yes. owner. And so how many properties are there? And I'd have to look at the plan. It's been a while since we looked at that though. Uh, and we also, as the person at the at the bottom where the uh, where they connect into, uh, he's had some issues with with it as well and hasn't been as cooperative as we would have liked. I wonder if any of the infrastructure funds could be used to, to repair something like that. I mean, is it a, a constant problem every winter? I mean, with uh, we, uh, sometimes with the, with the freeze and thaw on the ice, that's when it happens. Yeah. Uh, what we've been doing is when when we get them replaced, we we make it with no joints and you know and try to minimize the number of joints when when they uh, when they do the repairs. Uh, but that is something we I can uh, talk to John Salomon see if there's any ARP money for that. Yeah, and that might be something worthwhile to look into because uh, obviously I don't think. People would up the $17,000. No, and it was not affordable at the time, and that's why it kind of died. All right. Yeah, just out of curiosity. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions for uh, Chris? Hearing none, we'll move on to strategic presentations. And I guess there's one about the CEN Wi Fi system. Uh, and Chris, who's doing that? Uh, John Covey will give us an update on that. And Steve uh, will throw the presentation on this. Yep. There we go. We'll go to the, to the big kids table. <laughs> uh, put it off to the child table there on the side. <laughs> Ready? Okay. So I want to give you folks a quick update on where we are with the CEM public Wi Fi project. Uh, this is a partnership that we uh, entered into with uh, the state uh, a little over a year ago, trying to help them with uh, you know their uh, everybody learns initiative project, and then help that deploy here for the community as well. So if you go to the first slide there, Steve. Thank you. So this is kind of an overview of the project as a whole. Um, there are 20 urban and 20 rural communities across Connecticut that are participating with the state. Um, this system will support access to telehealth, education. 
um, uh, power, uh, pretty much anything that, that folks might need to get to the internet for, they can use the system. There's over 154 Wi-Fi access points across the state. Um, this all is part of CEN's high performance network. Uh, they uh, try to use community access wherever possible, link this to schools. Uh, those are the areas that could use it the most. And then with us, they partner with us here in this municipality. Um, the intent was to have underserved neighborhoods, places where people can walk up, public access places like parks, different places like that where people could have access to the internet. Um, the equipment, we had the, uh, donations for equipment and, and uh, materials that were made again. And the intent is for them to manage this for 12 months. Right now, all, in, all indications are that they'll probably extend that an additional 12 months and then we'll see what the management of that looks like. Next slide, please, sir. So that's a bit of an eye chart, um, but the bottom line, when you start looking at the numbers, uh, across the top, um, So in this area right here, it looks like we're going about 2,000 connections in total when the project started back in, in uh, a year ago, January. Uh, and then this last last January, we're up to about 2,000 connections, uh, daily connections. Um, excuse me, from seven, uh, 57 daily to almost 2,000 daily connections onto the system. That's statewide, that's not just here at all. Uh, but there's a high degree of, of, of adoption across the state. The map that you see here shows the, the different communities that are participating all across Connecticut. Uh, next slide, please. So for our portion of the project, we had 13 access points that were deployed within the community. Um, you know, we had those configured and delivered, we had them ready to go, and then we found different challenges with some of the locations that we initially had identified for the, the access for these devices. Uh, things like coming in and finding that there was no space on a particular pole, um, or there were other remediations that had to be done in that area before we could deploy the device. We felt it was better if we found an alternate location that equally served the community and didn't overly put a, a burden on, on to end people. Um, when you look at that black box that's off to the right in that slide, that shows you what the um, access to that network looks like. If you pull up your phone or tablet right now, you should be able to see that. And with one click, you can access uh, CP Public Wi-Fi. The other one that we have highlighted is Eduroam. Eduroam is part of that uh, network. Um, they partner with different schools and colleges so that students can authenticate to their particular school or university from wherever they are on the Eduroam network. So UConn students can get on in, in, uh, uh, in Norwich, Yale students can get on, Norwich Public Schools, et cetera. Uh, with this, uh, the devices we've been deploying are active and they're providing services in the community. We're still trying to assess to see what the, uh, the usage looks like locally and how successful that is. But it's already been a great benefit for us. When we run the emergency operations center in this room, anyone who's in here for the EOC can have access to the internet via the Connecticut Public Access beyond what we are to provide for the EOC. Uh, and we're planning on this becoming a good benefit for our customers as well because we will have a good present that will make a good signal for the customer service center. Anyone driving up, driving in, doing business will be able to access the internet as well. Next slide, sir. So on the right hand side of the slide, you can see the green uh, uh, chart there. That may look familiar to a presentation I made um, uh, back last spring that had the same kind of lo locations listed out, but this is the final location where these items actually ended up. Um, you can see we had to make a couple changes to those devices. And on the left hand side of the screen, there is a map that shows where those are in Norwich. But I think it might be a better thing to show you exactly what that looks like. If you right click on that, there you go. Look at the case, sorry. <laughs> you, may have, you may have to share a different screen if you have that on the screen. On a 
phone. Are you folks seeing the map? No. Yeah. Uh, now we are. There you go. Okay. So bear with me for uh, screen resolution here. <coughs> it's a little bit disorienting as that kind of turns around, but this is a fly through for these different locations. So this is the administration building here that we're in right now and our customer service center. Now the, the coverage area is roughly what you're seeing on the map. Um, it's not scientific, but it's pretty close to what you see. Franklin Street is now the, the closest one to us. The next unit closest to that is the uh, City Hall. We're servicing the area, again, that you see here in the map. This is now on the public library. We're covering that entire area. Howard Brown Park has a presence there. I don't know if it'll reach the boats or not, but we'll, we'll find out this summer. Here at Oakwood Knoll, we found that because of the, the number of homes that are there, we needed two units. We've got Oakwood Knoll number one, Oakwood Knoll number two. No which public uh, housing authority is up in there. We should have good coverage for that entire neighborhood. Here on Woods Drive is another uh, uh, housing area that we've got coverage for the CP Wi-Fi. Uh, the next go to Rose City Senior Center, covers the senior center, covers the school, the athletic fields. When we get over to Taftville, we've got one end of Taftville covered with the fire department, the church, the school that's across the street, down to the other end of Taftville where we have coverage there into the Panina Mills, and our final device is up in Ockham, actually connected to the hydro system that we have up there, covering that neighborhood and covering the other fields up in that area. So that's what we've got available. Oops. Close this up. We put this on the YouTube channel. Hang on, let me get it. There you go. Pardon me if I present and do the other at the same time. Okay, we're back to the meeting. So any questions I can answer for anybody? Do you know how many how many users there are currently in Norwich? Oh, I'm sorry? Do you know how many users there are currently in Norwich? We don't have those numbers yet. Uh, I have been talking with both CEN and with North Korea Academy to see if they've got any feedback yet, but they are aware that a number of people are using this. No complaints, though. I mean, it, it, no issues with connectivity. Yeah. And, uh, no, people, I think people are pretty well aware of it. I know the public library crew wants it. They haven't any, you haven't any, oh, yes, take calls. Nope. Not going to let them. And we're using it specifically, specifully too, so. Mm -hmm. Uh, we know it works. Yeah, I mean, when we had the last big deployment of the uh, EOC, we had everyone in here and they were able to get online uh, to access whatever they needed for the EOC. Okay. Anything else, Jackie? No, Any other questions? No, I like the video. Um, <clears throat> at the end, that was pretty good to show the coverage area, so good job. All right. Thank you very much. I, I guess, there's, are there any other areas we would like to expand to at some point? Well, I think there probably are, and I think what we would like to do is to get again, see what the data looks like, what kind of a return are we getting on that. Yeah. Find out a little bit more what the long-term plans are for the state with the overall project. Uh, but then, depending on what we'd like to do to extend it, we probably have to take a hard look at the backup. Um, you know, right now we have some availability for bandwidth on the existing system we have. If this were to say blow up and we would have you know, all throughout Norwich, I don't know if we would be able to sustain that. We yeah. have to consider that moving ahead. Yeah, but I mean, just, I mean, the only area that I would say, based on what you showed, could be added is maybe the west side. Um, yeah, it, there's a couple areas we looked at on the west side. The concern, I think, so, so again, with the state, they have certain criteria they'd like us to meet. They want to make sure that we're either in a residential area or a public, like a public park. So there's a public place where people get it. The, the limitation that we then end up with is, is that our infrastructure only runs across certain streets. If we were to, say, make a run that went down a particular uh, street on the west end, down into the neighborhood, that might be a $20,000 run of, of fiber in order to <coughs> Okay. I, I don't know. I'm just saying that that's an example. Yeah. 
Then there's also, I, th I believe, CEN has something with um, uh, Free Rivers Community College where they may have some access in that neighborhood as well. So it's, it's again, a couple, of, a couple of things where if we would want to see a pervasive network, there's an awful lot of infrastructure work that's happening going hand in hand with that. But for right now, we did try to hit areas where the public is present, underserved neighborhoods, you know, places where the things that, that people can take the best advantage. A little place like Mohegan Park. Yeah, so Mohegan Park was another um, interesting challenge. There was there's a dog pound up there, and we have access to a, a, a device in the dog pound. But when we took a look at where the heat map would be, where everything was going to, going to propagate there, we weren't sure that it was really going to cover the park very well. Gotcha. So it's a place we'd like to revisit, um, it, especially if it's something that we either we do a small add-on to what we're doing for the pilot, or if in the future we want to do better access for for Mohegan Park in general. Um, there was. Uh, is it is it Shady Lane that goes up the hill from over here? I think it was one of those we looked at, and then again we thought we could get up close enough where you could get coverage in the park. Mm -hmm. We just couldn't make the infrastructure work on our side. We need to almost like a movie theater in that it's empty all winter and and not terribly populated during the day, but summers and weekends mm -hmm. it, it's it's very busy. Yeah, yeah, and the, the so Howard Brown could have that same reputation. But where the device is situated, it's actually on the parking garage. So it actually extends into the downtown area. So if you're walking about, you can have access in, in downtown. Uh, you know, did open a device at Sun City Hall. Um, you know, I don't know that there's a lot of kids doing their homework sitting out in front of City Hall, but it does that where there is access that we have available in that area. If you log into one node um, in your phone, does your phone uh, automatically log into every other node? And anywhere it sees CP public Wi-Fi. So the CP public Wi-Fi, it, it, it's an SI, SSID, um, Secure System Identification. When you see that SSID and you log in, your phone will remember that. Now, because that network doesn't require you to sign in, it should attempt to log in every time it sees that. Now, there's a couple other things that the network will do. It, like it gives you a token that allows you to get in, and every once in a while you have to, to log out and log back in, even without connection, <laughs> just to get a refresh on that token. But if you see CP public Wi-Fi here, New London, New Haven, Middletown, uh, and we're in other towns, but they, they all, every one of those you should be able to access it for CP public Wi-Fi. Okay. The same goes to the attempt to, and if it could, it would. Yes. You may have to redo it, but it would try. Okay. Yeah, you may, what you may have to do is, is every once in a while, say, forget the network and then go back in, sure. and then you get a fresh token from that network and make sure that you can access it. You know, and the same can be said for Edge Your Own. Edge Your Own is set to go again, it authenticates to someone's school. So if you're an, a Norwich Free Academy student and you happen to be visiting relatives in Middletown, you can log in, check your homework, submit your stuff, do everything you, you need to do. I, I don't know if the dog will do my homework will, uh, will work anymore for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right, thanks. All right, great, any other questions? All right, I think we are concluded that then. Uh, Chris, do we want to go into executive session now, or do we want to skip to other business first? Um, is, is there other business from, you can, if there's other business to be added, we should bring out that. Well, I only have one thing. I just wanted to mention this. I've talked to Sean about this. I've talked to Chris about this. Um, I don't want to overburden everybody with committees, but, uh, you know, I think the Finance and Audit Committee has worked very well for the board, and we've worked well with you know Steve and, and Laura and Chris and so forth. The, the Economic Development Committee has done so as well, and I, I guess I was just wondering whether, as a third and final committee, uh, we might think about a communications committee, let's say, that works with Chris Riley and Chris uh, Rose and some other folks uh, on a number of different issues: communication with the public. Uh, marketing uh, of NPU, uh, employment solicitation. I mean, there's a whole raft of communication things. And I think Chris Riley and everyone else does a terrific job. But I just think it's always helpful when the board is connected to uh, staff. So I think I was talking to Chris about this tonight. I mean, I think maybe uh, Sean and who's Backgrounds in marketing, uh, and I and, and Chris.
Chris might chat a little bit about it. And at the next meeting, we have a proposal we'll bring it to the board. John, does that make sense to you? Yep, it does. I think that is a great idea. And, um, you know, it gives us some opportunity to um, collaborate and work together. And, um, you know, sometimes two eyes, four eyes are better than two eyes, or however many people are involved. And sometimes having things from a fresh or different perspective allows us to all grow and um, allows us to deliver the deliverables that we need to have, you know, whatever the subject matter is that we want to focus on. Perfect. That was, I just wanted to make that, that sort of comment. Does anyone else have any other business? Hearing none, we can then go to executive session. Uh, that's a big oxygen to the reading here. Um, the idea is to go into executive session to discuss confidential trade secret and commercially valuable confidential or proprietary information not subject to inspection or public disclosure pursuant to section 1.2.10.5 and 7.2.32a of the Connecticut General Statute. This information is commercially valuable, confidential, and proprietary and is not uh, for public disclosure pursuant to Public Act number 98.212. Uh, uh, to discuss and also to discuss personnel matters of an employee or employees and or public officials pursuant to Chapter 14, Section 1206A of the Connecticut General Statutes. Do we have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. Thank you, Michael. Second from Bill. All those in favor? Aye. It is unanimous. We are now in executive session. I'll have to wait up to get the uh, recording. No, the recording. recording. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we're out of the executive yeah. session and back into regular session. Yeah. And yeah. I would entertain a motion to uh, grant uh, Chris a $3,500 bonus, a 3% raise, retroactive to January 1st. With I'll a, second it. With a increase of with a potential increase depending on with a potential uh, uh, depending on what employee negotiations. Potential plus one. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. So all those in favor? Aye. All right. Opposed? It's unanimous. All right. Once again, in public session, thank you very much. I really do appreciate it. Spend it all in one place. Thank you. Okay. All right, now it's time for a motion to adjourn. Oh, I'm sorry. Do we have a motion to adjourn? I'll second. All those in favor? I've never seen that one. It's three enough in school system. <laughs> so, so, so what are your plans uh, where you head off to now? Well, my team is, uh, has his final game tonight. It's their playoff game. Mm -hmm. NFA? Conference game. No, uh, Eastern. Eastern? Yeah. So how much